Thank you. Wow. Thanks, everyone. It's wonderful to be back here. I was uh, remarking to uh, Julie and some other folks earlier that when I was here, uh, the School of Human was a little house. It was a little cottage, you know, and now I come back to this, this, this amazing, uh, amazing stuff for you. Uh, so it's just wonderful to be here and always be back in Madison. Um, so for today, just uh, in terms of ground rules, you know, I'll I have my dog and pony show, and I'm happy to to talk uh, your ears off, of course. But I would love it if uh, you have questions as I go along. Please don't hesitate to to shout them out. Um, I'd love to make it as interactive as possible. Um, so as uh, Julie suggested, I have a, a deep and abiding interest in understanding the uh, implications of adverse childhood experiences, the etiology of adversity, uh, the consequences, but then, of course, most importantly, uh, what we can do about it, right? What, what the implications of, of this research is for prevention and intervention as well as translation of research. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the adverse childhood experiences framework, um, just to make sure I'm quite certain that most people in the room have at least heard this terminology before, maybe have heard it too many times. I've got more with us now, but we'll try to just keep it as fresh as possible. I want to make sure everyone's on the same page. We'll talk about what the adverse childhood experiences framework <coughs> is um, and understand its implications for health over the life course. And then um, what I really want to do then is this focus on this, this evidence base and what we can do to take this evidence and translate it into uh, practices, programs, and policies that, that promote resilience. So without further ado, my background is in the area of child maltreatment. When I was here, uh, I did research uh, with Arthur Reynolds on um, the Chicago Longitudinal Study, my dissertation focused on child abuse and neglect and the consequences of child abuse and neglect. And indeed, this is a, a, an important topic, right? Uh, and there's a lot of child maltreatment in our society. Just looking at official records, administrative records of child abuse and neglect, uh, the most recent year uh, of data indicates that over 3 million children were reported and investigated uh, or uh, received an alternative response uh, from the Child Protective Services nationwide. And based on those investigations, nearly 700,000 children were substantiated, were verified as having been abused or neglected. And of course, at the most serious end of the distribution, the most serious uh, outcome, that being mortality, nearly 1,700 children uh, were recorded as having died due to child abuse and neglect. Now that is, uh, those are profound statistics, both in terms of their scope and their, their, their impact. But when you think about child abuse and neglect, and you think about officially reported uh, child abuse and neglect, I would make the argument that what we're talking about is really only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the amount of adversity and trauma that children in our society experience. Right? So the very tippy top of the iceberg, you have fatalities, right? Those 1,670 cases that <coughs> more that died. Then you have your victims, of course, your, your substantiated victims, the 673,000. Then you have your, bare, uh, your actual reports of abuse and neglect, your 3 million cases. Beneath the surface, though, there are many, many, many instances of adversity and trauma that children experience that never come to the attention of Child Protective Service officials or even necessarily to society in the United States. And so today, I'm going to be talking about adverse childhood experiences, both self-reported abuse and neglect as well as self-reported household dysfunction. <laughs> what I'm not going to talk about today, but that we can have maybe in the back of our minds, is that you could even go uh, deeper below that, right? Um, and think about not only uh, actual uh, instances of tangible adversity and trauma that children experience directly, but we could also think about how we structure our society in ways that are harmful to children. We could think about the social determinants of health framework um, and how that has implications for, for life force development. And if we really, really wanted to go deep, which we won't do today probably, we could actually uh, think that we might even be underestimating, even if we account for all these adverse childhood experiences, even if we account for these social determinants of health, we might even be underestimating the amount of adversity and trauma that resides within our communities if we take into account intergenerational and historical trauma. And there's all kinds of really cool evidence coming out in the field of epigenetics um, that's revealing that the implications of adversity and trauma carry across multiple generations. Again, 
won't go into that today, but just setting the table for where we could be heading with all of this. Okay, getting on the same page here, what is an adverse childhood experience? There are uh, five different forms of abuse and neglect and five different forms of household dysfunction that make up what most people today consider the conventional adverse childhood experiences framework. This emerged out of research that was done, as, as Julie suggested, uh, research that was done uh, by the Centers for Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente. Uh, I'll talk more about that study uh, that was launched in the mid-1990s in a moment. Anyway, based on that research, they identified 10 different adverse childhood experiences, the terrible 10, as I'll call them, um, including five different forms of abuse and neglect, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, as well as physical and emotional neglect, and <coughs> five different forms of household dysfunction, right? Five different uh, negative things that occur within households and that often operate within the ecology of child treatment, puts children at risk for child treatment, like uh, household substance abuse, household mental illness, domestic violence, incarceration or jail, and divorce or separation. Now, for the time being, can we all agree in this room that these experiences are best to be avoided for optimal child development? Can we all, are we all on the same page with that, that if, if possible, we, we, we'd prefer to avoid these things if we're a young child, right? Okay, very good. We'll come back to that. So this study, this ACE study, the Average Childhood Experiences Study, what was it? Major, one of the most significant public health uh, discoveries, really, of, of, of the modern era, launched in the mid-1990s. Robert Anda and Vince Felitti are, are, are the, the two best known investigators associated with that study, the investigators. What they did was they uh, enrolled in, in two different ways, over 17,000 different uh, patients who presented for health care in the San Diego, California area primarily. Um, the vast uh, majority of these uh, participants were well-educated and relatively affluent, given that they all had Kaiser Permanente health insurance. Average age of the sample was about 57 years of age. Why? Because why are they slightly older? Because who goes and receives health care on average? Older people tend to go see health care more so. What they, what they hypothesized was a very simple notion, is that the drivers of, of health outcomes, many of, uh, of poor health in later life, are not just driven by biological mechanisms, right? They're not just driven by genetics or biology, that they're also uh, uh, driven in part by our early experiences, right? And so they wanted to test that out. And so they uh, surveyed these individuals, they asked them an array of, of questions about their early life experiences, and including uh, those ten, terrible 10 that I mentioned before. And so what they found is, first, three, three key revelations from this study. I'm going to simplify it uh, and, and move things forward. Three, uh, three key findings from the study. Number one, ACEs are far more prevalent in society, perhaps, than was commonly believed at the time. They found nearly two-thirds of people in this relatively affluent, uh, well-educated sample had been exposed to at least one ACE. Now, study after study uh, since that time, there have been many replication studies over the uh, past generation, um, have, have found pretty much the same thing within a domestic context in the United States. Almost every study you'll find uh, will show that adults, more than half of adults, if you survey them, report having experienced at least one ACE during their childhood. This, these are findings from, the, uh, from Wisconsin, uh, the 2010 Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. Uh, findings that were conducted here in Wisconsin. Uh, uh, they found that 56% of Wisconsin adults reported experiencing at least one ACE. Now what this slide also reveals is, is, is the second, a second key finding from, from the ACE literature, which is that ACEs tend to overlap. They tend to correlate with each other, and that's not just the ACE study. Risks in our environment tend to correlate, such that if you are exposed to one ACE, you are at an elevated risk of experiencing a second ACE, right? You can see that only 22% of the sample ex uh, was exposed to exactly one ACE, such that most people who reported at least one ACE actually experienced multiple ACEs. Now, why is that important? Because that leads us to the third revelation, which is that the more ACEs you're exposed to, the worse your outcomes tend to be. Now, they focused primarily in the, in the, in the original case study on physical health outcomes as well as, to a lesser degree, mental and behavioral health outcomes. But 
Many, many studies have looked at many, many different domains of development and function and found basically the same thing. The more ACEs you're exposed to, the worse your outcomes tend to be. And it follows what's called, what the uh, you know, medical practitioners call a dose-response effect. And that's important, right? That's important because it's sort of a, a, a telltale sign of causality. When you see that the more dosage that someone is exposed to leads to comparable effects, like an increase in, in effect, that's some kind of indication that we're not just talking about something correlational. We're talking about something potentially that's causal in nature. So let's look at a few outcomes if we could. And, and again, I apologize if you all have seen this stuff before, but bear with me. Um, take smoking, for example. Uh, I don't have the, the outcomes listed here, but. On this side is early initiation of smoking. On the far side is are you currently smoking? Two different outcomes, very closely related. You see the same pattern of findings, such that uh, if you were exposed to zero ACEs, only about 4% of participants who were exposed to zero ACEs indicated that they had started smoking by the age of 15. If you were exposed to there we go, uh, four or more ACEs, Roughly 12% of, of those individuals reported that they uh, has, had initiated smoking at an early age. Roughly a, a, a threefold increase in the risk, right? And the same thing is true of current smoking, right? Roughly the same kind of pattern. And again, what you see here that's important is it's not just comparing, say, four or more ACEs to zero. We see this ladder-like or dose-response sequence such that the more ACEs you're exposed to, the worse your outcomes tend to be. Here's smoking. Here's obesity. Second verse, same as the first. You can see that same dose response or ladder-like sequence. The more ACEs you're exposed to, the more likely you were to be obese. How about heart disease? Again, same, same basic story. The distribution is slightly different. The risk seems to be piled on more so at the upper end of the, of, of the ACE distribution. But you can still see there's that ladder-like sequence, right? couple key things that I want to point out here. Number one, when we're talking about heart disease, when does heart disease typically manifest? When is it typically diagnosed in the life course? Later, later on in life, correct? So we're talking about outcomes that often don't manifest, at least until you're 40, typically until you're 50 or 60 years of age. And they're finding this connection to experiences that occur when people were 5, 10 years old, right? How, how could that be? How could it be that these early life experiences could manifest in, in these later life health problems? And by the way, it's not just heart disease. They found the same types of associations for, for stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, cancer, etc. Right? Why? Well, one answer lies perhaps in these other outcomes that we looked at. What do these indicators have in common? What's the story here, smoking? obesity, heart disease. Please, somebody tell me, what, why did I choose these three indicators together? What do they tell us about the story of why, how ACEs could lead to heart disease? Smoking, obesity, heart disease. They're related to stress. They're related to stress, for sure. We're going to get back to that. That's a key theme. What leads to heart disease? Smoking and obesity, right? And typically speaking, what we, what we see in terms of a causal ordering of things is that we think of smoking and obesity as leading to heart disease, as opposed to, say, heart disease leading to smoking and obesity, right? So what we have potentially is, and this is just one narrative, is it are, are some causal pathways that we can be, begin thinking about, where we can begin tracing the breadcrumbs from these later life uh, manifestations of morbidity and and, and even early mortality, right? We can walk those all the way back, potentially, to those early childhood experiences and begin to think about the mechanisms, the pathways through which those, those outcomes manifest. So, if we're thinking about disease and dysfunction, like, like heart disease or what have you, um, what leads to them? Well, how about health risk behaviors? Smoking, alcohol and drug abuse, poor eating habits, risky sexual behaviors, what have you. But we can also then walk that further back and think about what happens closer to the, those proximal processes. What happens close to the point in time when adversity occurs? When they're actually within the context of adversity, what's going on, right? So what, what happens to children who are maltreated? 
or who are exposed to lots of adversity, what happens to their social and emotional development, their cognitive development, that can then in turn lead to those autonomous behaviors. We can walk it even further back and think about what, what's, what, what adversity does in terms of stress mechanisms, and what stress does to uh, neurobiological development, does to our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortical systems, right, our fight or flight response systems, what it does to our brain development, et cetera, right? And so what we have in the end, potentially, is this story where adverse childhood experiences, um, or, or the opposite of adverse childhood experiences, really rich, uh, really rich uh, positive supporting environments sets a foundation, right, for life course development. Um, and you can either be establishing a very weak foundation or a very strong foundation. Um, now, I know many of you in the room are interested in, in early childhood development. <coughs> we could even get more molecular if we wanted to and really think about some of those specific pathways or mechanisms early in the life course. I've already noted many of them before. I won't go into these in any, any more detail. But I just wanted to sort of pique your interest to get you thinking about, um, about potential mechanisms of effect. Um, through which cases lead to later life problems. Okay. Now, questions? Please. So, can I'm assuming people run all of these um, as multivariate models, so they're controlling for mm. some of those things? So, no, epidemiologists actually uh, oftentimes don't use uh, a lot of controls for other things. And actually, it's a really important point that I'm going to get back to, I think, with some of, the, some of my findings, um, where, yeah, they're not accounting for other unobserved factors that could otherwise explain these effects. Right? We're also going to, we're also going to talk about, okay, do you, do you control for those other factors, or do you exploit those other factors? Right? So are there things that you want to control for, or are there other potential adversities that we could, should be thinking about measuring and actually testing their effects alongside these bases? These Great question. Please. Um, so the ACEs that you went over the terrible 10 yeah. seem to be mostly within the household and the home environment, coming from That's um, right. caregivers or parents. Yes. Um, is there separate research or is it included with factors that maybe outside of the home oh. or like deaths in the family? Okay, Such a delightful <laughs> question. It's like, I, I, I swear I didn't plan for it, but that you're, <laughs> you're, setting, you're setting me up. Uh, Absolutely. So these are all measured within the immediate microsystem, right? Immediately within the household. Is that the only place in, in which adversity occurs? No. Right? So should we be thinking about a more ecologically valid ACE model, potentially so? And I'll come back to that. Okay. Great question. Please, Rosanne. So I wondered in terms of epigenetics um, and even more proximal uh, variables, whether the um, nature of the caregiving um, relationship has been looked at in terms of what's potentiated as well as temperament of the <coughs> child. So um, from a resilience perspective. Right, so are you thinking about like uh, inter interaction effects or is that? Uh, um, could be interaction effects, but just looking at um, the interaction of interactions. <laughs> okay. So the quality of the parent-child mm -hmm. relationship as uh, buffering or potential. Right, right, right. Um, so there has not been, to my knowledge, within this specific specific sphere of work, right, where people have looked at protective factors, if you will, that can help to, to buffer uh, uh, against the ACEs. But I think I'd love to come back to that when we start talking about uh, implications for intervention toward the latter half, because I think it's really it's a key question. And, and the child's temperament as well, in terms of resilience. Absolutely. That's great. Please. Yes. Has anybody ever looked at the unique contributions of each of the different ACEs, right? So mm -hmm. if you think about Great um, you know, these 10 different events, yeah. you know, yeah. some of them are more highly correlated yeah. with each yeah. other yes. uh, than they are with the others in the composite, right? And yeah. So if you had you know, something like substance use and mental illness, those tend to go together, yeah. yep. right? And so if you had a score of two, but it was those two, that might be less risky than if you had substance use and physical abuse or substance use and domestic violence, yeah. right? That kind of creating these cumulative index scores may be hiding some of the important information Absolutely. Uh, that lies in these. So this is a, a really important <coughs> question, right? So a couple things I'll say really quickly in response to that. People have looked at length to try to identify that sort of that question of type, of which type is worse, 
you know, if, if you will. What they tend to find, by and large, is that type matters less than, than actually amount and severity. So there's actually a good reason why they create these cumulative risk scores, because they actually tend to be really, really powerful, and that uh, the influence of type tends to be somewhat simple, sample dependent. Like, you don't find consistent effects, right? You'll have one study that say, oh, sexual abuse seems to be the worst, and this, the other study will say, oh, no, physical abuse seems to be, seems to be the worst. The coefficients bounce around a lot, and depending on your sample, uh, because they're so highly correlated, you don't get consistent effects often in the literature. If I, would, if I was to pick one out, I hate to pick any one out, I would say maybe divorce or separation is, is, is the, the runt of the litter, personally, um, just based on, on what we know from the divorce separation literature itself, as well as what plays out within the within the ACE literature. But there's also some limitations to the, the question. But that's probably because divorce and separation has the lead, has the smallest correlation <coughs> in any of the other nine. Exactly right. right. That exactly right. So, so the power right. comes actually from their correlation. Right. Total correlation, right? It, exactly right. And uh, Gary Evans uh, has has a really good paper on this recently. He <coughs> delves into this whole issue about you know. The, the strengths and the limitations of cumulative risk indexes. And I, and I can't remember the year of publication, but it's been within the last three to four years they put something out that not if you send your email, send it to it's really good. Please. Um, what were the age ranges? I'm wondering what qualifies as childhood experience. Uh, less than 18 is, 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 is the convention. Okay. Is that like, Yeah, I is just wonder if, uh, like, but if that's the sample then that's, that's like what you're speaking. I'm thinking of like adults who experience some of these things within their setting me up perfectly as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. You guys are fantastic. Yes, we're gonna come. I promise we'll come back to that as well. Yeah. So, <clears throat> kind of building off of Rob's point, <clears throat> um, the cumulative risk yes. implies that having one more is always going to be worse, and I think. I can think of instances in which that's not true. So having the presence of a an abusive parent who's then removed through divorce or through incarceration is probably better than having the continued presence of that parent, I would guess. It's, it's, a, it's a complex scenario, right? And it's tough to speak to. Right? Well, we, we know from the divorce literature, right, that having the breakup of a high conflict marriage is better right. than having the maintenance. Is it the divorce or is it the, the phenomenon that led to the divorce that really has the implications for Well, the, the most elements. divorces are low conflict and those are right. bad. Right. 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 right, Kids are upset by those, but the end of a high conflict marriage, Paul Mata's work shows, is good for kids. Right, right. So I, I'm wondering, I mean, maybe those scenarios don't happen a lot, but I just wonder if there are some kids who have lower cumulative risk scores who are actually worse off. There, there's no doubt. We're we're talking. These, these are this is these are blunt force instruments we're talking about. Right? These are best. Uh, these types of, uh, of of measures and human risk scores are best when you're when you're trying to describe population health phenomena, and they're less good when you're trying to explain individual differences. Right. So I, I completely agree with you. Um, okay. Excellent question. You guys are on fire. So. Um, <laughs> And some of the questions I think highlight, and this is not certainly the end of the story, but some of the things that I'm interested in terms of the next wave of research, I've already highlighted this notion that we need to move perhaps beyond uh, simple main effect associations to thinking more about, about mediators and moderators of effects, et cetera. Um, I think we need to take a, maybe a step back, too, and think more about what an adverse childhood experience is. Um, the, the literature has sort of been founded on that original Kaiser Permanente CDC study, and rightfully so. That being said, is there any added value to considering other potential sources of, of adversity, both within the home and outside the home? Um, and then lastly, most importantly to me, um, as a social work scholar, is what can we do to translate this evidence into action? And I think that's one of the biggest gaps in the literature lies. So I'm going to be showing you all some data today from uh, the evaluation uh, program of research that Julie mentioned before. I've been the, uh, the lead evaluator for the state's Family Foundation's Home Visiting Program since 2011. Uh, I know probably everyone in here are familiar with home visiting programs. They are a broad class of, of interventions that um, typically uh, aim to improve 
uh, maternal and child health outcomes, promote positive and sensitive parenting, or reduce the risk of child maltreatment, and also that can help to promote uh, child development and school readiness. That's sort of their, uh, their, their shared objectives. Um, and you can see that, that uh, the programs that serve families in many, many different regions throughout the state, urban, semi-urban, and rural. So we, as a result of uh, this work, uh, accumulated a pretty nice little data set where we can kind of look at adverse childhood experiences in this population. Uh, the population that we're talking about uh, that I'm going to be looking at are all women because the vast majority of primary caregivers at these programs target are women. So all 1,523 in this data set are women. You can see that it's racially and ethnically diverse, reflecting the, the geographic distribution of, of uh, the sample, as well as the fact that it, they are almost all low-income women, over 98% to within 200% of the poverty line or receive. Uh, public benefits. And of course, you see that the average uh, female in the sample is also young as well, 24 years of age. So, what we're going to be looking at uh, is primarily data on adversity <coughs> in this sample. Um, and uh, a few years back, uh, along with uh, uh, some of my colleagues, I developed a, a tool called the Childhood Experiences Survey. Very simple uh, ACE survey. What we did was we took uh, the, the ACE module that is in the, the, the BRFIS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, and we modified it slightly. In the BRFIS, they only asked about eight ACEs. We wanted to make sure that we also measured neglect. They didn't, they didn't measure neglect. We modified the, the items a little bit. But then the main thing, that we did, the main value add, is that we started to ask other kinds of questions. Other kinds of questions that, uh, about adversities that we think you could potentially define as an ACE if you wanted to. So we ask questions about extreme poverty and homelessness. So we ask people uh, about how long they were exposed to, for example, serious uh, family financial problems. We ask about food insecurity. And again, we ask about homelessness. We ask about death of a parent or a sibling. Uh, we also ask about a prolonged, parent, did someone experience a prolonged parental absence that was not due to the death of a parent? Um, <coughs> why do we ask about that? Well, think about divorce or separation. Uh, it's certainly an important phenomenon, right? I'm a child of divorce. I can attest to its, its implications. That being said, the, the question itself is predicated on marriage, right? If you ask somebody whether or not their parents were divorced, in order for that to be registered as a risk, right, their parents have to have been married to begin with. Well, a significant uh, percentage of our sample, and, 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 and for, for many low-income families, many of their, their parents were not uh, married to begin with. Right? And so you're missing something potentially. You're missing potential uh, dissension or, or, or even the dissolution of families that can have significant implications for, uh, for, for young children. You're not capturing that with the divorce and separation measures. So we ask about prolonged uh, parental absence with one of your parents out of your life uh, for, for a long period of time. We also ask about peer victimization or bullying as well as violent crime victimization. <coughs> Why do we do that? So the, 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 the question I received earlier, right? Adversity doesn't just occur in the immediate microsystem, it also occurs um, in other microsystems outside of the household. So we wanted to ask about two salient uh, potential sources of broader ecological adversity, right? So in, in some, what we're trying to do is to see if we can build a more ecologically valid and cross-culturally valid mousetrap, right? Does, is there any value added to, to including these, these other indicators of adversity? An empirical question at the end of the day. The other thing we did that was, I think, kind of innovative, and we'll come back to this too, is that we asked uh, clients, uh, we asked families about their potential discomfort with these questions. Why did we do that? Because we received a lot of feedback from frontline practitioners saying they felt somewhat uncomfortable asking these kinds of questions. There were, you know, there were concerns that, that their clients would decompensate, right, and just start you know, crying, or that, that they drop out of their, their services, or what have you. Um, and so, again, it's an empirical question, so we included a question. But how uncomfortable were you about answering these questions? Okay, quickly. What did we find? A oh, please, yes. I'm sorry, I'm Not a problem. Are you asking about the moms or the children? Ah, excellent question. We're asking the mothers, I should clarify. We're asking the women in the sample, they average about 24 years of age, we're asking them to reflect on their childhood experiences, right? It's a great question. Um, what did we find? We found. Lots and lots of adversity in this economically <coughs> disadvantaged sample, to no one's surprise. 
Uh, roughly two out of five indicated they had been physically abused. Half indicated they had grown up in a household with a, uh, where substance abuse was, was, uh, was there. Well over a third indicated that they had grown up in a household where someone had, uh, had been incarcerated or in jail. All of these eclipsed the rates from the original Kaiser Permanente study, some of them more so than others. Like for example, incarceration or jail, the rate, this is more than uh, seven times the rate that they found in, in their study, just as an example. Overall, 85% reported they experienced uh, at least one ace, compared to women in the Kaiser Permanente study was about, about two thirds, 67%. And, and over two thirds reported they experienced multiple aces. Now, Here's just a, a, at the higher level of, levels of adversity, say that four or more risk threshold. You can see that in the original A study, about 16% indicated they experienced a lot of adversity, 43.6% in the present study, right? So, very basic message here, um, and this is not the only study of this kind. In economically disadvantaged uh, samples, communities, whatever, typically you're going to find elevated levels of, of cases. Okay. Very simple. How about some of those other adversities, though, right? Those, uh, other than the terrible 10, we also see that uh, extra familial adversity, <coughs> such as peer victimization and violent crime victimization, was not uncommon. Look at those rates of prolonged parental absence, well over half, indicate that one of their parents had been out of their lives for a prolonged period of time. Nearly a quarter had experienced the death of a parent or sibling. A significant majority had experienced significant financial problems. Nearly a quarter, 22.5% had been homeless at some point in their childhood. And again, why do we measure this? Because you know, we, we think that there could be some value add to, to capturing other kinds of adversity. Now just homing in on, the, on the, the bottom two here, why are we really interested, why am I interested in, in these? Because I think that while most of the literature tends to focus on poverty as a risk factor for adversity, right? as, as a risk for ACEs, um, I think there's good reason to believe that we should be actually conceptualizing poverty as an ace itself. That extreme poverty in particular, you could conceptualize as an ace. This is research done here at Madison Hanson, and this is including Seth Pollock and, and Moore. They looked at brain volume and the implications of, of poverty for uh, brain volume trajectory. Right? And you can see, very briefly, um, that they divided their sample of children into three different socioeconomic strata, high, mid, and low. You can see that uh, to the extent that you can measure uh, the, uh, brain volume accurately at five months of age, they found they're roughly equivalent. In fact, for whatever reason, the low SES groups seem to have slightly more dense brains at, at, at five months. But you can see that over time, their paths diverge, right? Such that um, by the time they're three years of age, the high SES group has the richest, densest uh, neural connections and richest, densest gray matter. Mid SES is in the middle, low SES is at the bottom. <coughs> suggesting that poverty itself can have direct effects, <coughs> potentially. Um, and the effects of poverty mimic the same kinds of effects, potentially, that eight, those other cases that they'll get. Okay. Another question I received earlier, which was so insightful. What about uh, adversity that occurs after the age of 18, right? The ACE framework, very valuable um, framework. Could we potentially apply that beyond the age of 18? So what I did in a, a more recent study that, that is still ongoing, we have a panel study going, going on called Families and Children's Driving Study, is I developed a, a complementary tool called the Adult Experiences Survey, where we ask adults about trauma, adversity that had occurred since they turned age 18. Can we take a look quickly? Are we in? Okay, good. So uh, here are some of the adversities that we looked at. Again, this is the same uh, sort of sample of women. There's a subsample of the, of the same women that we looked at before. Economically disadvantaged women uh, receiving home visiting services. What did we find? Um, that since the age of 18, I think my battery is out here, that's all right. Uh, more than three out of five reported they've been emotionally abused by a partner. Uh, more than two out of five have been physically abused by a partner. More than one out of five have been uh, sexually abused uh, since they turned 18 years of age. Nearly a third have been the victim of crime. Uh, one out of eight indicated that they were discriminated against frequently. Interestingly enough, discrimination um, uh, did not seem to vary significantly by race and ethnicity. White women overall appear to be as likely to endorse being discriminated against as were racial minorities. Um, here are some others. 
substance abuse, mental health problems, incarceration, nearly half had a partner or a spouse incarcerated or in jail. More than a quarter had been incarcerated or in jail themselves. Um, more than a third had been homeless. And uh, again, uh, a quarter had experienced chronic conflict, basically a quarter their entire adult life. Again, underscore the point here, the average age of these respondents is 24.3 years of age. Why is that important? Why is that important? Why, do I, why, why am I highlighting this? Now read my mind. Why is it important to know that the average age of these respondents, when you're looking at these elevated, <coughs> these elevated levels of, of adversity, why is it important to know that they're 24 years of age? Please. Is it because having something to do with your brain development? Potentially. Potentially. Could be, we could be talking about sensitive periods of development. That's a possibility. So they're all relatively young. Apparently. Yes. And why does that matter? They're young. In terms of these because prevalence probably rates. the reason they became a young parent had to do with their... Ooh, that's an interesting parents. notion. I like that notion. Please, yeah. They, this is only since they were 18, so it's in the past six years. Yeah. And what's going to happen to the prevalence rates, maybe? Go up. Right? Oh. This is as low as they're ever going to be. Right? They're 24 years age on average, right? These rates are as low as, as, as they be. Potentially, if we surveyed them 10 years from now, <laughs> we find rates that are Okay? Now, what about the link between childhood adversity and adult adversity? Uh, interestingly enough, we see the same kind of dose-response uh, effect if you look at the association between early childhood adversity and adult adversity, such that uh, the more ACEs that you reported, the more likely you were to have reported high levels of adult adversity. This is four or more adult adversities. Um, that we just looked at, you can see that, for example, if you, were, if you uh, and these are, these are all being compared, by the way, to a reference group of people who reported no ACEs, right? So compared to people with no ACEs, if you had five or more ACEs, you were eight times more likely, right? Roughly eight times the odds of having high-level adult adversity than people who were exposed to no ACEs, right? Meaning that, of course, Childhood adversity increases the risk of, of, of adult adversity. Another way of looking at potentially is that uh, environments tend to auto correlate, right? That, that the environments you're exposed to early on, you tend to, uh, those environments tend to correlate over time. There's another implication here, too, uh, which is that this is, uh, and I think this somewhat gets to your comment, Ruth, which is that these women are all receiving home visiting services, right? And so certainly we want to think, and I'm going to make the case that we should be thinking about in the context of two generation programs, we should be thinking about a caregiver's childhood experiences in terms of informing our services, but also recognizing that that adversity isn't necessarily an old story for them, right? That potentially they're also experiencing lots of contemporary adversity and that their children are as well. These children uh, may be operating within, a, within an environment of toxic stress, et cetera. Okay. So, Let's talk a little bit um, about uh, uh, implications for practice. Let me take any, any burning questions right now before I, before I dive into this. Please. So um, I'm not quite sure how this figures in, but if you look at the um, gender of the individual, so this is primarily women, was there any... <laughs> All women. Okay, so was there anything done on looking at the dads? Like there, was not there any necessary. outreach to any of the dads in this? We, we, we've surveyed some, but, uh, but not in this particular study. There's other research that's focused on males, though. Yes, please. I'm wondering about how the data was gathered if, if during the home visiting, the home visitor had a relationship with the respondent, question. and maybe they answered differently right. versus, I think, in Kaiser right. Permanente, they were just given a piece of paper. Right, so there's two different sources of data here. That all of the ACE data <coughs> is actually gathered by the home visitors. Right? Okay. And there's, we actually created practice protocols around it and everything where they were supposed to do it within a certain window of time, like right, you don't do it on your first visit, but you also don't wait until six months into services because why the many of them will have dropped out by then, right? And you want to use that information hopefully to inform your your understanding of your client and your, and your case history, right? The the adverse adult experience was, was gathered by us in a, in a research lab. That's a great question. Please. The original um, ACES work by Letty was actually interviews. I'm sorry, say again. The original work was actually interviews. Right, right, the lengthy interviews. Yes, and, and he, um, when I talked with him at a conference, he um, had, had great concern about how um, papers are, you know, screeners are handed out. 
in sure. clinic visits. Sure, absolutely. So, the, but how you've been doing it is more of an interview, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's, it's there's a there's a there's a practice protocol built built around it, if you will. There's a training protocol in terms of helping the home visitors themselves understand the tool better and, and how to interface with their clients uh, while they're they're. Uh, so the clients are selling it out, but. So sometimes, so one, one recommended approach that we recommend is, that, is to actually sort of have a copy of it on hand, right? And they, they can actually be looking at the questions with you while you're interviewing them, okay. right, as well. So that's, that's one, but one isn't recommended approach. I have one other question, Tony. Please. Um, have you yet um, created a child? Pieces um, for the same population. So we talked a lot about that. There's lots of things on the horizon, right? Like uh, wanting to create a free screen out of this as well. Um, so the answer is no. We haven't. We haven't done that. Um, it's. It's. Uh, my guess is partly why it hasn't been done is because it's a very sensitive population. Also, partly because it's very difficult to know how to ask those questions say, a very young children, right? So there's been some work done with adolescents, I'll say that, but not with, like, say, younger children that have to self-report. Uh, that, that would be a challenge, I think, in, in some ways, to self-report uh, reliable and balance on people. <coughs> Great question. Um, so actually, I'm going to talk a little bit about the value of assessment um, in terms of the practical implications, because that's a lot of what I, what I focus on. So one thing that, uh, and, uh, that that I've been thinking about uh, a lot, and along with one of my colleagues, Dimitri Tupinsis, is, um, is is how to sort of, what kind of organizational framework or rubric can we use to organize our approaches around trauma-related services? Um, and this is not just, just us. This is, these, are, these are terms that get bandied about a lot in the literature and in general practice. And oftentimes, the terminology isn't necessarily used with a lot of um, uh, insight or evidence behind the terminology. I'm not sure I'm going to take us much further today, but here's, here's, here's what I got. So I think, how, a quick show of hands, how many of you have heard of this, uh, have ever heard the term trauma sensitive? Anybody ever heard of that term before? Maybe? Trauma informed, trauma informed care, everyone around can have trauma informed care. But what about trauma focused treatment? Right? Whether or not there's a distinction, please, I don't know, but I think there is. Uh, I'm going to try to briefly um, um, uh, gloss over some of these distinctions. I'm going to focus primarily, though, on uh, what I mean by trauma-informed services, what I think it means. So when we're talking about trauma-sensitive services, what do we mean? We want uh, providers, people who provide health and human services, social workers, whomever, whomever they are that work directly interface with clients, we want them to, to, to recognize trauma and its consequences. We want people to be well-trained. If you're an educator or what have you, today, in today's society, it's pretty much normative for in, in most uh, educational or health and human services for people to at least have some loose understanding of this thing we call trauma and its potential consequences, potential implications for development. And that's a good thing. Um, and ideally, we also would like for people to adhere to trauma-informed principles, which I'll talk about very briefly momentarily. Key distinction here, uh, the key point about trauma-sensitive <coughs> services is uh, that really when you're delivering trauma-sensitive care, trauma-sensitive services, you're not really addressing trauma directly. It is not your charge as a practitioner in certain spaces to actually be working on a client's trauma directly or to even to be asking them about their experiences of adversity or trauma. So if you're a, a, a school teacher, right, that's not your job, right? It's not your job in, in, in a, if you're a third grade teacher to ask a child who maybe has some emotional or behavioral dysregulation in your classroom, hey, you know, is it possible that, you know, your, your behavior problems are linked to serious adversity and trauma in your life? No, that's not your job, right? Nevertheless, maybe you can do your job better if you have some insights into trauma and its developmental implications. Maybe you have a better purchase on what's going on um, potentially within that, that child, uh, intrapsychically, if you <coughs> cognitively, emotionally, what have you, um, and it can make you a, a better prepared practitioner within that particular space. And there's a whole trauma sensitive school movement um, that, that's emerged. If you're interested, there's, there's more information that you can get from the Department of Public Instruction here in Wisconsin. 
So that's trauma-sensitive services. I'm going to go on the other end of the distribution and, and talk about trauma-focused services or trauma-focused treatment. This is completely at the other end in terms of a level of intensity and cost, if you will, right? These are types of services that really try to get at sort of the root causes of different types of mental health and post-traumatic disturbances, right? Um, a lot of these are, are, are mental health treatments, right? And they, many of them focus on present-focused uh, relational work, um, as well as past-focused uh, trauma narratives, right? Trying to help people better understand the sources of their current pain and dysfunction, making those connections, and then hopefully integrating them, integrating those uh, experiences in, into uh, a, a new unified sense of self and, and, and healthier well-being. Some examples, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, expo exposure therapy, et cetera. You could label those as trauma-focused treatments, right? Great stuff. I mean, really, really good stuff. Some of their limitations are that they require rigorous clinical training and supervision, right? Not just anyone can deliver them, right? They, um, and uh, they also require significant resources, a lot of time, a lot of money. They're very expensive services, right? So they're typically only delivered to, to people who manifest with significant disturbances, right? Um, and unfortunately, sometimes they only reach people who have a capacity to pay or who can actually access those services. Okay, great stuff. Now, trauma-informed inter trauma services, in some ways, lies in between the, the two, right? Um, and I know that term trauma-informed care gets banned about a lot. I'm not going to go into great detail about all the principles of trauma-informed care or what have you. But briefly, what are we talking about? We're talking about services where you recognize the importance of, of the, the person that you're working with, that, they, that they're safe. And we're not just talking about physical safety, of course. We're also talking about psychological safety. Um, and so part of creating a, a sense of psychological safety and security is the environments <coughs> that we expose people to, right? And when we expose people to, to, to regular and, uh, and well-structured environments, they tend to feel safer, right? So we want to create environments that promote trust and support, uh, that promote emo um, emotion and attention regulation, that promote social and interpersonal skills, agency and autonomy, and respect for individual and cultural differences. I'm thinking of Julie's wonderful model that she that she developed. This she has this wonderful model that that melds sort of the biopsychosocial perspective with the bioecological systems theory into one thing. And so, very much in line with what we're talking about here. This is what we're talking about in terms of the types of environments that we would like to create if we're if we're working in a trauma informed way. But I'm less interested in that, to be honest with you. Uh, and I'm more interested in these practice elements. What does it mean actually? What do you do when you're practicing trauma-informed care? I don't know, but this is my take on it, that if there's something unique, if there's something that I would put in that trauma-informed care box that is distinct and separate from maybe trauma-focused services or trauma-sensitive services, is that you screen and assess for trauma exposure, you assess trauma impact or consequences, and you refer to other services as needed. Right? So, screen, assess, and refer. Those are what I would consider to be sort of the unique practice elements that fall within this domain of what, I call, what we call trauma-informed care, right? Did you, were you exposed to adversity or trauma, right? What kind of implications did it have for your health and well-being, your development, how do you, and then, you know, your job as a trauma-informed practitioner is not necessarily to provide those high-end uh, mental health treatment services, as trauma -based treatment services, your job then is to hopefully identify appropriate providers of those services. That's sort of the way I see it. Feel free to disagree uh, if, if, you, if you wish. Quickly, question is, and do we have, we have till 1.30, is that correct? But I know I'm supposed to wrap up around 1, right? Fair enough. So back to that theme of, okay, if, I, if I'm making the suggestion that I think that trauma-informed care you know, it should be predicated in terms of practice elements on asking about trauma exposure and asking about trauma consequences. Well, we have to go get back to that question, should I ask? And I'm just here to, to say for now, in brief, that study after study after study has been conducted that has, has looked at this question. Is asking about trauma harmful? If you ask people about their adversity, if you ask them about their, their trauma, does, is it potentially harmful, right? We want to do no harm. And the, the simple fact of the matter is it's very, very rare for uh, clients to be harmed 
by asking these kinds of questions. Uh, most, the vast majority of clients, and this is based on empirical evidence as well as my own anecdotal observations from the field, it's, it's uh, clients typically actually tolerate these questions uh, quite well. The, the most normative response is actually to become slightly internalized. The big fear among practitioners is like, again, someone's going to decompensate and it's going to be wailing and it's going to, you know, just, just have a very, very difficult time you know, recounting this. The, the most typical uh, response is actually to be a little bit quieter, a little bit more reserved, um, and maybe not want to talk about it that much. But they tend to talk <coughs> fairly well on average. You really want to offend somebody, ask them how much money they make. That's, that's, that's a good way to get, get somebody upset. Um, in any event, this is a, please, yes. Yeah, just a question. So you gave a few examples for the trauma sensitive and trauma focused yeah. potential professions where that would be their framework. Um, and I imagine with the should I ask question, um, like you were saying, you wouldn't ask somebody on your first home visit, hey, tell me about your abuse. Yes. But uh, it, would, it would be necessary to have some sort of a trusting relationship to get hopefully the most honest response. Potentially so. Some examples of what professions you feel like are best equipped to I I think I'm busy. And I'm actually going to talk about a, a, a pilot project that we're going to be doing that, that's going to be designed to do just that. And home visiting for multiple reasons. Partly because of that rapport and trust. Partly because they can reach a lot, a lot of people. Okay. Um, great question. There was another question I saw a flash. Yeah, it was similar to that. I was just wondering about um, like training level of whatever kind of profession you're promoting to have a trauma-informed approach. Yeah. Like, if it's something that... Um, in your profession, you're just already at the appropriate training level because you're a home visitor or your therapist or whatever it is you want. Or if it's like um, there should be some like, base level of when is it appropriate to ask these questions, what are your follow-up steps afterwards? So are you suggesting, are you asking whether there should be sort of specialized training around this? Well, kind of, because I think in your first, um, or in your, in the trauma, Focus. You talked about like professionals that have specific training in this, like therapists. Or mm -hmm. Right, right. Therapy. But what would that level <coughs> of training, I guess, look like for that middle version? Right. It's great. It's it's an open question, right? And so I don't think I have the the answer to that, right? I think what I what I would suggest is that each profession has their own standards of accreditation, right? And what what is considered appropriate uh, for, for a given practitioner to know within your field, whether it's education or criminal justice or whatever it may be. What I, my appeal would be, and I think the field is moving in this direction regardless of what I say, is that I think increasingly uh, a, a, a trauma is becoming a, a central theme um, uh, in, in training, in base level training in almost any professional uh, walk of life in, in human services, right? So if you're a child welfare professional, right? There, there's no child welfare professional on earth who's been hired in the last 10 years that hasn't been at least received some some base level training in trauma and its implications, right? And it'll vary by discipline. I don't know if that answers your question in satisfactory. But I don't have the I don't have the final word on that. Um, so a couple other quick things is that not only do I think that that asking these questions is it, uh, there's limited evidence to suggest that it's harmful. There's actually some decent reasons to believe that it actually might be helpful. Not only anecdotally, we heard from many, many people who are just thankful to have somebody ask about their personal experiences and be able to tell their story. But there's, there's also this potential to underestimate human resilience. Like, if we want to avoid these questions because they're, these people are going to be too sensitive. We may be underestimating the, 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 the capacity for resilience and we're also, and I'll get to this point momentarily, we're also uh, potentially <coughs> losing out on an opportunity uh, to engage in strengths-based practice. So why assess for trauma? Good, better, best. First, we, we, we want to assess for trauma as a program that provides us useful data. We can track our client outcomes. So that's what better is hopefully we can use that information to inform our practice. Why do we conduct any assessment? Because we want to inform our understanding of our client, right, and help us work better with it. Right? We want to make the, and it helped the client also make connections between their past, their present, and their future, right? It can also enhance motivation and so on and so forth. 
The best for me is, is recognizing that assessment is practice. <coughs> assessment doesn't just inform practice. Assessment is practice. There's really good evidence to suggest that just by asking questions, that part of your intervention effects actually occurs during the <coughs> assessment phase. That process of asking questions actually drives some of the effects of your intervention, right? And when, in the case of, say, ACEs or trauma, it actually provides a very natural pivot to strengths-based practice. Even though you're focused on these negative things, right, you can actually then in turn, in that moment, in vivo, say, wow, look at all of this that you've experienced and yet you're still here. How is it that you've survived all of this? And also, maybe let's talk a little about your coping mechanisms. What, what did you do to cope with this, these situations? And then in turn, maybe even that will lead to conversations about maybe some coping mechanisms that were not so often, right? And that maybe motivating, uh, may help to motivate them to address, address other ways to, to cope with pain and suffering or what have you, right? In turn, can enhance motivation as well as self ethics um, Real briefly, and I know we're, we're, we're up against uh, the time limits here, I just wanted to, to highlight one potential, one project where if you think about what does it look like if you were to actually operationalize the trauma from care in a, in a, in a project. So there's this really cool universal home visiting model. Anyone heard of Family Connects? Also, it used to be called Durham Connects. Okay, hello. <laughs> um, great. So this is a universal brief home visiting model. Universal meaning like everyone gets it, right? So you work within a particular catchment area. You you do your recruitment in a hospital. Everyone who gives birth in that hospital or whatever hospitals you're working with, everyone um, uh, has a chance to participate. You go and you recruit actually while the person is in the hospital. Hey, are you willing to re receive like just a, a single home visit? Is basically the notion, and the vast majority of people say yes. Why? Because all families, regardless of risk level, have some needs. All all new moms, all new parents typically report that. Gosh, you know, I'm I have some concerns about being a new parent. Yeah, I'd love to have a nurse come out and like at, at the very least tell me that my kid's doing okay, right? And these, what do these home visits focus on once they do receive their home visit? Assessment of family strengths, risks, and needs. Also some brief anticipatory and supportive guidance to address any needs they may have to help motivate them potentially. And also then a key part of this model is connections to community resources. This model puts a lot of its eggs into that basket. Before you even get started providing any services, you have to really do this big community scan and develop really tight, rich community connections. And it's a triage model such that everyone is eligible for one visit, but then if, if, if certain families have greater needs than others, they can re receive additional services as needed. They can receive additional visits. They can receive additional phone calls, et cetera. So then we can be balancing out sort of that, uni that, 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 that benefit of universal prevention, right, where everybody gets something, with this need for sort of social welfare, if you will, and wanting to, to um, right-size our intervention based on, on clients. Now, what we're doing in this project in Racine County is we're going to be replicating the, the Family Connects model, but then we're going to add a little wrinkle, see how it works out. Um, my colleague, uh, Dimitri Dubitsis, who I mentioned before, developed a, a really cool model, I think, uh, called TESPER. How many of you are, are familiar with the ESPER model, right? Screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. It's a gold standard approach with alcohol use disorders as well as drug, drug disorders. Right? What do you do with screening, grief intervention, referral of treatment? It says it itself. If you have an alcohol problem, right, uh, and, you, and you present it to some sort of service agency, first they screen you to see if you have a problem, right? Then, as soon as they screen you, if, it, uh, if, if there is some sort of indication that there's, there's an issue, they conduct a brief intervention um, to try to promote motivation to change and that kind of stuff. And then, as needed, uh, if there's deep end problems, you refer to treatment. Well, what he did is basically took that previous concept and overlay trauma on top, right? And so what do we do with trauma? We screen for trauma as well as its consequences, conduct a brief sort of intervention focused primarily on, on some motivational interviewing principles, and then refer to mental health treatment as needed. So we're going to be basically integrating this model within this universal home visiting program. Um, and we're going to see how it goes. And that's sort of this notion of Again, trauma-informed care and practice, right? Screen, screen or assess, and then refer to a treat, uh, to treatment as needed. That's my guy. Questions? <laughs> Please, Ruth. So I have a question, um, yeah. just for curiosity, in terms of um, if you're familiar with the 
secondary preschool or veterinarian yep. yep. studies. Yep. Yep. Um, now, granted, probably much of what started there, the control groups and everything, was four years ago. <coughs> um, and this probably wasn't around then, right? Correct. And, but I'm wondering if there has been any attempt to identify um, both the parents that were in that group and the children that have grown up from that group um, in terms of looking at the role of really connecting children that are experiencing potentially adverse childhood experiences and really connecting them to the highest possible quality of early childhood program, which is where they're spending the majority of their waking hours right. during the week. Right. Um, so I'm just, I, I'm wondering about that. You've gone to home visiting. I totally get it and yeah. agree. Yeah. But I'm also wondering about making that linkage and if there's been any look at that. Not to my knowledge, but I, mean, I, I guess I want to honor the, 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 the conceptual genius of what you're saying, right? Which is that whether we're talking about uh, center-based uh, uh, preschool programs, right, which oftentimes, uh, like, what I would consider many of them to be two generation models, many of the ones that I tend to gravitate to not only you know, serve children within that center, but they also interface with parents, right? They maybe do outreach into the home, they encourage parents to come in and, and engage with their children, et cetera, right? And two generation models, I, I, I couldn't be a bigger fan of them, right? And within the context, we're talking about diversity, the, the big idea here is you have both an intervention and a prevention program built in one, right? By addressing the, uh, the adversity and trauma of the caregiver, you're potentially intervening, helping to promote their health, mental health, well-being, et cetera, but you're also potentially then preventing the next generation from being exposed to adversity, right? If you have, if you have a caregiver who's more present, more, better regulated, more centered, whatever terminology you like to use, um, potentially they're less likely to either their own children or to operate within an environment in which their children are, are elected to experience adversity. So I think it's, I think it's great. Other questions? Please, Julie. Um, so I was just thinking about um, in your study where you asked the moms in the home visiting program about their adult experiences yeah. of adversity. Yeah. It seems to me a lot of those adult experiences of adversity would be while their children were alive. Do you have any idea like how many years that in the birth of their child, because I was like, that is the kids' aces, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. so I just, I'm just kind of curious if you have even those data where you can match it up to know when the kids were born and versus those experiences. We could probably do it in an asymmetrical way, right? Like we, we can't do it precisely where, um, where we where we could know definitively where the child, the focal child was in, in terms of and match that to the, to the parents. Um, uh, adversity. What we could do, I think we do have data, I know we do actually, on um, oldest child in the family, for example. So we could we could at least, at the very least, detect um, whether or not some child in that household has been exposed to those same types of, of, at least indirectly, those same types of circumstances. That being said, no, we don't, we are, however, it is a longitudinal study, we are gathering data on the children themselves, their development, and so forth. So we are going to be able to at least look indirectly at whether the parents' childhood adversity as well as the parents' adult adversity has implications for child development. And just a follow-up question that makes me think of, you know, there are certain things that have been increasing in our society over time, like homelessness and parental incarceration and some of those things that right. show up on your ACEs. Yeah. Do you think that the um, number of ACEs that children are experiencing now are, are actually more than their parents did, given similar right. socioeconomic right. environments? I'd say, I'd say yes and no. <laughs> so actually, in, in the area of child maltreatment, um, relative to say 20, 25 years ago, the rates are, are significantly decreased. Over the last five years or so, they've bounced around a little bit, say somewhat even, if you will. But compared to say the, the uh, late uh, 1980s and all the way up to say the mid 1990s, where rates skyrocketed in part due to crack cocaine, et cetera. Um, rates are significantly down in society, um, and that's not just administrative data, that's self-reported data. So that's, there's pretty robust evidence there that there's actually less of that in society. Now, what's interesting about abuse and neglect is that that decrease has been driven primarily by a decrease in physical abuse and sexual abuse, not in neglect. Right? And neglect is closely tied with poverty, 
if you will, right? And, and rates of poverty have not decreased significantly. So that's not that big of a surprise, but it does seem that as a society, for whatever reason, we've gotten a little better at, you know, at, in, in those domains. Where it gets really complex, and it's not a, not a popular, uh, uh, popular notion, but the, uh, as we've discussed, these risks are interrelated, right? And there can be unintended consequences, good or bad, for these different types of, of, of risks. So you take parental incarceration. I'm the last person on earth to advocate for more incarceration. Right? Yay, let's, let's lock up more people. However, there is some evidence to suggest that possibly, or at least there's, there's a, a decent hypothesis, that part of what may be driving the, the reduced rates of child maltreatment are actually the increased rates of no incarceration. Right? So it's very, very complex and somewhat thorny to talk about in public settings. Yeah, I don't know if that answers. <laughs> it's complicated. It is. It's, it's complicated. It's always a good answer. Yeah. It depends. It's always the best answer. I always tell my students. Please. Yeah. Um, so thinking about the original terrible time of ACEs, yeah. um, a lot of them obviously, well, they all obviously are traumatic for children, but a lot of them also seem like they would disrupt social support in adulthood. Like if you're an abusive parent, or a parent, substance abusing parent, you probably can't depend on them, and you're an adult as a source of support. Yeah. Um, so is there any evidence about how much of it is about childhood trauma and how much of it is about adult support network? Gosh, it's a, it's a great question. It's a big question. I think it probably will depend in part on sort of like your field of allegiance, right? What you tend to focus on, right? So an attachment-based researcher might say, well, you know, there are, there are schemas for, for, you know, relationships and, and their, their understanding of, of others and, and understanding of themselves, right, is going to be disrupted by these early environments. And that, in turn, will lead to an increased likelihood of having poor relationships later on in life. And there's certainly evidence to support that. You can come at it from many, many different angles to try to... So what you're getting at, the key, again, I don't have the empirical argument for you. What I have is the conceptual argument. And I think the conceptual argument, again, points me back to the importance of looking at those mechanisms to effect. Right? And I think that's really the next generation of research is... You know, there's always a call for longitudinal, prospective longitudinal data. It's like, okay, we'll pay me, right? It's like, where's the money? Show me the money, I'll do it, right? I'm happy to do it. Um, but there's a great need for that, to be able to answer those kinds of, of rich questions that you're, that you're talking about. Please. Um, I'm just curious, since it is a huge age range, so you're talking about the age Yeah, age, when is if, it worse? If there um, has been work done or questions asked about I know there's a lot of talk about like formative years and what is most risky age yeah. rise of when you're exposed. And yeah, yeah. From what I know, like you know, nine to thirteen, the really like right. around puberty is yeah. really terrible for yeah. big up people. Yeah. But is there time? Is there a time so when it's more years. or less? Yeah. 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 Thinking. So it's a great question, and and uh, so it's a question of time, right? And a lot of people are interested in this question of time. Um, and so you have competing. What you have are you have all these, you have these counterfactual hypotheses, right? And you have these competing phenomena where oftentimes what you get is mud in the middle, right? So your developmental psychopathologist will, will tell you, you know, early is worse, right? Because that's when the architecture of the brain is being established, all these different key fundamental processes that last a lifetime, cognitive processes, attachment processes, these are all emerging, right? And so if you experience lots of adversity, stress, trauma during those periods, that is going to have outsized implications over the life course. True. Then you have your life course theorists who say, well, hold on a second, right? The effects of the environment have their greatest impact proximal to the event, right? And that, uh, and that the further you move away from adversity, if you will, right, the, the more that those scars tend to fade a little bit, right? And so oftentimes what you have is, like, if you measure Say if you're interested in the phenomenon of juvenile delinquency, let's say, and you measure trauma in early childhood versus trauma mm -hmm. at age 12, you're going to find at least as robust an association at age 12 mm -hmm. as you will trauma at age 2. Why? Because it just happened, mm -hmm. right? At least in terms of your measurement, right? So often you get these, these when it comes to the, the, the level of measurement, you oftentimes can't, I haven't seen a lot of studies that have been able to suss that out. Um, you know, then you can get into developmental notions about again, critical periods or windows and sensitive periods. Um, and again, there are counter, 
failing things there too, right? Because there are sensitive periods beyond early childhood. All state bias. I mean, I tend to, I tend to err as an early childhood person, I tend to err on, you know, sort of the develop, I err slightly on the developmental psychopathology side of the of the ledger. But uh, to answer your question, there's not like a, you know, and and I, I I think the implication that I take away from it is, and I actually. I wrote a paper on this. I, uh, it was titled "Unsafe at Any Age," right? Yeah. And that sort of <laughs> part of the pun, right? There's a unsafe, un, unsafe at any speed. <laughs> From way back then. Um, the fact of the matter is, like, you know, the timing question is a great one, but the, the fact of the matter is, no matter when it happens, it's just bad. Right? Yeah. Like these things are just bad. They point the life course. So it's unlikely, in my estimation, that it would be virtuous to tailor our policy prescriptions based on age. And just a quick follow-up, is it better if you receive intervention earlier, uh, would you say? Gosh, again, a really complex question. It depends. So typically speaking, I'd say yes, right? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's absolutely true. I mean, there are other examples, though, in the literature that you can turn to and say, well, sometimes actually it's good to wait, right? So this is a completely different body of literature, but there are um, you know, some kinds of interventions, like critical incident stress debriefing. Anybody ever heard of critical incident stress debriefing, right? Where you go in immediately after trauma has occurred, right? And you debrief with a person, right? Like say after 9-11, they went in and set these mental health projects in to ask them questions. And they found that those, those intervention approaches are <coughs> beneficial for some people, neutral for many, and actually harmful. Yeah, that, some, that there are some iatrogenic effects associated with asking people about their, their traumatic experience immediately after it happened. And then the notion here might be, you could think of like a wound, you could think of like a knee injury, right? If you, if you have an ACL injury or something like that, do you, do you have your surgery like an hour later or, or even the next day? No, you wait to let the swelling go down. Maybe there's something similar to that in the mind, that there's some benefit to allowing natural restorative properties to take hold, natural support services to, to be in place, and then, as needed, come in and ask those trauma yeah. questions. Thanks. Ah, yeah. Um, Julia mentioned, and I, I'm familiar with that, um, you're doing some work on uh, parent-infant, uh, parent-child uh, interaction, interaction therapy, therapy yeah. and maybe CPP to compare? Uh, I'm not doing anything. Okay. I'm familiar with it, yes, but okay. I'm, not, I'm not doing So anything. I just wondered about um, implications from what you've been learning for therapeutic interventions and what you're looking at with that. Um, and you mentioned also um, assessment as being intervention, basically. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so the idea of asking <clears throat> about when I mentioned yeah. childhood ACEs yeah. for very, very young children, sure. I wasn't thinking about them being asked. And I know, Julie, you were saying, well, the ACEs are what the adult is experiencing. but. To, there is a, a, a tool um, on NCTSN website, um, mm -hmm. uh, the TESI that Shana yep, sure, sure. Um, has developed, that is asking the parent about the right. um, child um, experiences of their young child. Sure. And I'm just wondering, you know, that is a little bit different than asking them about their own experiences, <laughs> and it made an intervention in itself to wonder with them, get them thinking about the experiences of their I, I child so. I think it's supposed to? I think it's great. We need to work on it together. Okay. <laughs> so, can you say something else about um, the um, PCIT though, what you're doing with that? Sure. So the, I'll just briefly describe the study. Um, but So what we, what we want to do is a, like, is a translational research study where you have this model, parent-child interaction therapy, really sound intervention, right, uh, comes out of the parent management training tree of conceptual tree. Um, and great model, but like a lot of these clinical models, clinically efficacious, um, we know less about their effectiveness, and they often don't reach children that we might argue need it the most, right? Like low-income children, children who have been abused and neglected. These, these services often sort of get tested in research settings, and they tend to stay in similar settings. Um, and so what we, what we try to do is adapt uh, the model so that it, it could be implemented as a, as a group-based model with foster parents, because that's how foster parents receive their training, right? So what we did is instead of starting with the model, we started with the system. Right? We said, okay, how do foster parents 
receive their services. They receive it in a group-based context within a training instructor. So we then re-engineered the model so that it fit within this foster home training uh, structure and tested it out. And it was it was efficacious, and that's great. Um, you know, I, I think more work needs to be done like that. It's it's very there are very good reasons why these models don't ever make it you know into into play into the child welfare system because they're they're expensive and the child welfare system is just cash strapped. It's just the fact of the matter. And, and so uh, we're often rearranging the, you know, the deck chairs, if you will, on the Titanic. And, and uh, you know, I, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, this will lead to more work of this kind. Our next phase of this, and we've started implementing it in a routine fashion with Children's Hospital of Wisconsin in, in, in Milwaukee. Um, but the next step would really be then to take it a, a step further up the, the scale and begin to integrate broader principles of parent management training. I'm not wedded, I don't PCIT, I don't, I'm not dogmatic about the model, right? I just know that this particular model is good, but there are other parent management training models that work. What's important are these principles and these common elements, right? What I want to do is integrate those into like statewide foster parent training, right? And then that statewide foster parent training can then serve as a feeder system, right, into the actual intervention for kids that need it, right? So it's sort of again like a, a triage type of model, right? And because one of the challenges with, with these interventions is actually getting foster parents to show to show up to get into the intervention, right? And so anyway, that's more than you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'm well, gosh, this has been a delight. Thank you all so much. <laughs>